Our Old Testament lesson is going to come from the book of Micah. As we finish up our look at Micah 6, we're going to read Micah 6, verse 6 through verse 8. What shall I come before the Lord? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I've always loved meeting smart people, people who are good at their jobs. Honestly, I, 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 regardless of what their job is or what their skill set is, I've always been impressed with people that are talented. I've always, I've always enjoyed learning from folks. So if, if, if you and I have had a conversation, I can almost promise you, if you and I have had a conversation about your job, I probably ask, what do you do? Ooh, what does that mean? And I'll, I kind of ask those questions because I want to learn more about really all kind of stuff. Uh, it, it's funny as, um, as Sarah and Thomas have grown in band, I know nothing about music other than I like it. That's all I know about music. I know how to work a radio and that's it. And so I'm always asking, well, what does this mean? Oh, what is, it, what is that instrument? How do you play that? What does that do? What does it sound like? How does that, in, you know, usually dumb elementary question because I have no clue, but I, I want to learn. I, I, I love meeting folks that are engineers because my brain does not work in an engineering type of mentality. I don't think that way. So I'm always que asking questions about that. I love talking to, uh, talking to folks who are lawyers and see how the law works every Every church I've been at, I've had some type of um, expertise in my church. When I was in, in Philadelphia, I had a bunch of foresters in there. So I learned about how lumber works. Of course, the Delta had farmers. But Philadelphia had foresters. Ripley, surprisingly, had a bunch of accountants. So I learned a lot about accounting. Peddle was a military town. So I learned all about how Camp Shelby works and all those type things. And, of course, here I've got all kind of folk that I've learned all kind of stuff from. It's been fun to learn. I keep, uh, I keep all my old sermons. Every, I, I, keep, I, have a, I have a copy of basically of every sermon I've preached since I took my first appointment in 1999. And some days I'll go back and look at them. Y'all, I feel like I need to write letters to my previous churches and apologize. But hear me, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying I'm any good now. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying I'm any good now, but goodness gracious, I was bad. <laughs> and I had with it the added bonus of thinking I knew everything. <laughs> so I go back and read and I say, ooh, this is a beautiful combination of ignorance and arrogance. What a great combination to have. <laughs> That's what most of my early sermons were filled with, was that beautiful combination of ignorance and arrogance. I was too dumb back then to not know what I didn't know. I think that's one of the things that life teaches you sometimes is you just learn what you don't know. And the old, John Wesley said, the older I get, the, the more, of a, the more uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, the more of a, uh, an allowance I make for human weakness. I think that's a good, pretty good rule of thumb. The older I get, the less I realize that I actually know. And the more I want to surround myself with smart folks who know something, who can teach me something. And that's a real gift. We've spent these last few weeks looking at, I think, one of the more important passages in all the Bible. Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so we've talked about these things, what it, means, what it means to do justice. And to do justice is to so radically love your neighbor in such an overwhelming matter that you won't to, you're going to do all within your power to make sure that your neighbor knows the fullness of God's life, both now upon the earth and in eternity. Because my great desire for my neighbor is that they have enough to eat, and they have enough clothing. They have what they need upon the earth, but also that they have the gift of eternity in God. So, so what it said, what it said in first John, you know, if we have the goods of this world and, and we, we, we see a neighbor in need, you know what, we need to help them. You know, that's to do justice, to understand that every gift we have, is a gift from God. 
And that my desire is so deeply rooted in that desire that I have to love my neighbor as God loves them, that I'm willing to use everything I have to love my neighbor, both here upon the earth, but ultimately in eternity, so that they can know Jesus, to do justice, to love mercy. That's that beautiful Hebrew word, that Hebrew word, hesed, kindness, that redemptive kindness of God that we see laid out before us in the story of Ruth, how Ruth kindness redeemed Boaz. Boaz's kindness redeemed Ruth and their kindness towards each other redeemed Naomi. Mercy is God's redemptive kindness. A God who loves us so much that he wants to redeem us. And so to love kindness is to love that same kindness of God. Not just, not just to think that kindness is a good thing. Not, and this is not some, love, to love kindness is not just some warm, fuzzy, ooey-gooey, be nice to people thing. But this is to see the potential power of redemption in every life out there. And to love that. To love that. To desire everybody to come and to know Jesus. To love kindness. But today, today may be the, the crux of it all. To walk humbly with your God. This is a beautiful uh, phrase, a beautiful kind of conclusion to these verses. To walk humbly humbly with your God. It's interesting as, as, I, as I read about this, because I don't know about you, I can't speak for how you read the Bible, but when I, when, I, when I read this passage, I typically always have focused on the humble part. Walk humbly with your God. That's kind of where my mind's always drawn, is the walking humble. But it was very interesting when I started reading on this passage and reading some commentaries and doing the Greek and Hebrew and all that, the word walk is an interesting word there. When it says to walk humbly with your God, that walk there, that walk that we see there, is the same word that's used in Genesis 3, where it says that God would walk in the cool of the evening with Adam and Eve. It's the same word that's used later to describe how Enoch walked with the Lord, and then he was no more. So I think walk, I think you that early morning walk, you go in on in the morning when the dogs start chasing, you got to take your stick with you to kind of guide this dogs out the way or the, the walk where you got to dodge people as you're walking on the road, you know, that walk. The word walk here in this passage isn't so much focused on the physicality of the walk, but it's a word deeply rooted in relationship. To walk Humbly with God is to be in an ongoing relationship with God. This is not a word of activity. This is a word of relationship. To walk humbly with God is to have an ongoing, daily, rooted relationship in God. And see, that's why this is the crux of this entire, entire passage. Because I'm not going to desire justice for my neighbors on earth and in heaven if I don't love, if I'm not walking with God. Because I'm not good enough, y'all. I'm a hard headed son of a gun. You know? I'm all, I'm one of my favorite, I was talking with somebody yesterday. One of my favorite lines is by Rich Mullins, the former Christian songwriter who's passed away. Rich said, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, but I just want to be about the Lord's work. I'm all about some vengeance, y'all. Let's go get them. Let's get them. I love Tombstone. Let's saddle up. You tell them I'm coming. And I'm bringing it all with me. You know? Yeah, let's go get them. That's where Andy's heart usually is. <laughs> that, that's where Andy usually wants to be, is in that vengeance mode. That's why I've got to walk with God. That's why I have got relate, that relationship with God. Because that walk with God is that redemptive part that changes me. I don't always love kindness. You know, there's some folks I'm not sure I want God to redeem. Let's be honest with each other, y'all. There's some folks we might not want God to redeem. There's some folks we might not think are redeemable. Some folks we just don't like. We got a list for them. We got a list of them. Maybe you don't, but most of us do. I don't know that I always want God to redeem. What's the old prayer? Prayer, God, be with me and my wife, our kids, us four, no more. You know? 
I'm not sure the folks outside the walls of this church would deserve redemption. Maybe they don't. That's where my heart wants to go sometimes. Go get them, God. The only way I'm gonna lo- the only way I'm gonna do justice and love my neighbor so radically that I desire for them to have what they need. The only way I'm going to love kindness and desire redemption for the entire world as God does is to walk humbly with God. To walk with God. Because here's the thing about walking with God. The longer you're around God, the more you walk with him daily, the more he changes who you are. Uh, my Rooted in Christ for tomorrow is talking about a passage in Galatians where Paul says, did we start with the Spirit and end with works? In other words, we're saved by faith, yeah. But so often, we think we're saved by faith, but we're sanctified and we grow by our own human efforts. What happens is we find our faith frustrating because we try so very hard to do right. We find ourselves failing at doing right. And then we get mad at ourselves and we get mad at God and we get mad at everybody else. The key to life is that walk, y'all. If we're not walking with God, nothing else is going to matter. If we're not walking with God, we're going to return to our old ways. We're going to return to our old hearts. We're going to return to our old actions. We're going we're to live a life like that. It's not about doing. It's not, we like the, the doing part's a to-do list, y'all. The first thing I do when I sit down on my desk on the mornings is I make my to-do list. Who do I got to call? Who do I have to email? What do I have to do? I like that to-do list. Well, the greatest part of your to-do list with God, the greatest part of your to-do list with this lesson, with this passage, is to walk with God. That's it. Because if we get that part wrong, nothing else matters. If we miss the walking with God part, then the rest of it doesn't matter. So we walk humbly with God. We have that relationship with God. In humility, there's a great quote I wanted to, um, humility here talks about that posture. Okay, so we walk with God, but how do we walk with God? How do we walk with God? Because sometimes, sometimes um, when I first got saved in college, not to be cocky, I was probably the greatest Christian to ever live. I mean, Jesus was better than me, but that was about it. I was, I was pretty awesome. I mean, God really got lucky when he got me. Let me tell you, he really got lucky. So one day I was sitting in the cafeteria at Colin, just proud of my awesomeness and how holy I was. This guy walks in, dirty hair, long hair, filthy looking guy. Sits down, I thought, huh, look at him. Look at me, man, I'm awesome. And he ought to be like me because I'm awesome. He sat down, took his hat off, and said a prayer over his meal. Then I realized, ooh, wait, I forgot to pray over my meal that day. That day. Jesus tells a story about a Pharisee and a tax collector. The tax collector looks at the Pharisee and says, Lord, thank you that you did not make me a tax collector. In other words, God, aren't you lucky to have me? The tax collector beat his breast. And so, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, one man went away justified. To walk humbly with God is the posture with which we walk, but walk with God. It is, for us, it is for, for us to understand that God's not the lucky one. We're the lucky one. And to understand that we don't know everything. We don't understand the fullness of God. I want to read to you a quote that, from Beth Moore that someone shared with me. I love this quote. It says, everything he tells us is true, but it's also true that he doesn't tell us everything. Isn't that a great quote? Everything he tells us is true, but it's also true that he doesn't tell us everything. I don't know the fullness of God's mind. I don't know the fullness of God's wisdom. I don't know the fullness of God's heart. I am, I, am, I am Job when confronted with God, where Job says, I put my hand over my mouth for I've spoken much too soon. Your ways are not mine. The Bible says his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. So we walk with God, but we walk humbly with God, knowing that ultimately he is God and we're not. And there are mysteries. There are things we don't understand. There are limits to our faith. There are limits to our rationality. There are limits to our reason. I like for everything to make sense, y'all. I'm cut and dried, black and white. Everything makes sense. I want, 
I want a to-do list. I want everything to be clean cut and everything to be perfect and everything to make sense. And that's not how God works sometimes, y'all. God doesn't always work like that. There's a mystery to God. The Spirit moves in mysterious ways. We struggle with the mystery. We struggle with the mystery. We we don't think about that mystery of God, that He is the sovereign God of the angel armies. He spoke everything into existence. He is greater than us and smarter than us and stronger than us. So we walk humbly because he is God. And the beautiful thing is that the God of the universe, the God of creation, the God of all that he is, both seen and unseen, this God chose a magnificent way to change the world. Chose to use you and me. Chose to use the church. He chose to use the grace of Christ that is lived out through our lives. He loves you. And maybe he didn't always make sense. Maybe life didn't always make sense. Maybe you're like maybe you get to heaven and you got a whole list of stuff you're going to ask him because it doesn't make sense to you. I know I am. I've got a whole list of stuff I'm going to ask him about one day. But it doesn't matter. Because what matters is this. He loves you. He sent his son to save you. He desires a relationship with you. And he has shown the old man what is good. What does the Lord require of thee? But to do justice. To love mercy. To walk humbly with your God. There's a lot that I don't know. <laughs> you just ask my family. They can tell you the whole lot of the list of stuff that I don't know. But I do know this. That we are loved by an amazing God. And that he has shown us what he requires of us. To do justice. To love mercy. Walk humbly with our God. One of my favorite scenes in all of Scripture is in Isaiah 6. In Isaiah 6, um, Isaiah, is the prophet, says, Isaiah the prophet is in the, in the Holy of Holies ministering to the Lord, it says. And um, it says, the Lord of God, appear, the Lord of uh, hosts appears to Isaiah. And Isaiah has such an interesting reaction when, he see, when God appears to him. When God appears, Isaiah says this, Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord God of hosts. Isaiah sitting there doing his thing, and God appears. And Isaiah, his first reaction is, whoa, 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 whoa. You are, you are, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. <laughs> nope. You're bigger than me. You're stronger than me. You're mightier than me. You're holier than me. You are something different from me, and I can't, I can't do this. This is too much for me. This is too much. And the word says that the angel took a, it took a, uh, 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 picked up a coal from the altar and touched his lips to purify them. Told him to go and speak. There's a lot we don't know, y'all. This world can be crazy. There's a lot going on in our world we don't, there's a lot going on in our world we don't understand. A lot going on in the church we don't understand. A lot going on all over we don't understand. And we can become paralyzed <clears throat> by what we don't know. We can become paralyzed by the mysteries. We can become paralyzed by the anger. We can become paralyzed by the hate. We can become paralyzed by all the stuff brewing out all over the world. We can just be overwhelmed by all of this. And it's so tempting and it's so easy and it's so sometimes even enjoyable to focus on all these things. When the word says clearly here, he has shown thee what is good and what is the sovereign God of hosts requires of thee. To do justice, to love your neighbor radically, to love mercy, to love redemption, to walk a relationship humbly, the posture of submission with our God.
I don't know much. I don't know much. But I know that. And if we spend the time that God gives us on the earth living out this radical vision and mission here, y'all, oh, what a life we would have lived. And oh, what a difference we'll make in the world. Because there's a world out these doors, y'all, hungry for Jesus, hungry for redemption, and hungry for hope. And he has placed you and me where he has placed us to accomplish this goal. By the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, may it be so. Let's pray.